Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is safe and having a beautiful morning. Welcome to the town of Miami Lakes and its Economic Development Committee present Back to Safety webinar. On behalf of the town and its Economic Development Committee, we would like to express our sincerest gratitude for the support on this webinar. Before we get started, I would like to introduce Mr. Steve Brimo from Bank United. Steve Brimo has been employed with Bank United for over 16 years and is currently the market leader for the bank's Miami Lakes and North Miami markets. His previous positions in Bank United included regional manager from the Northeast Dade South Broward market, as well as the retail sales manager for the Miami Dade County branch network. His relationship with the Miami Lakes business and civic community started in spring of 2004, where he opened successfully managed and significantly grew the bank's Miami Lakes branch. Active in the local community, Mr. Brimo is currently a member of the Town of Miami Lakes Economic Development Committee, represents Bank United in the Miami Lakes Chamber of Commerce, and was past president of the Rotary Club of Miami Lakes. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to um, hand over the screen to Mr. Steve Brimo. Elizabeth, thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of Bank United, uh, we are pleased to continue our support to the town of Miami Lakes and especially the Economic Development Committee uh, for these uh, very uh, pertinent webinars. So this is the second webinar of a series of five that will be exclusively uh, sponsored or supporting and uh, kudos to the team at the Economic Development Committee uh, for really zeroing in on the subjects. Uh, these are very pertinent subjects. Uh, as you know, Bank United has had the relationship with the town of Miami Lakes for over 16 years. We're a locally headquartered um, bank, probably the largest locally headquartered bank in South Florida with our main offices in Miami Lakes. Um, we've taken extraordinary measures during this pandemic to ensure the safety of our employees and clients. And we've established very, very um, clear and very well thought out safety protocols for our team. So the majority of the, of, of, the, of the employees that do not need to be physically in the office are working remotely, but our retail branch teams throughout the state of Florida and New York are actually manning their positions and showing up for work every day to service our clients. So the protocols exist and again, this webinar especially for the town of Miami Lakes and the businesses and the restaurants are very pertinent. We have, we have very good relationships with quite a few businesses within the area. We have supported and actively lent to them during the uh, PPP loan program to, to really help out uh, these restaurants and businesses when they, were, when they had the issues to keep their employees um, on the payroll. So we know them and we're looking forward to really continuing to work with them when things hopefully get back to normal sometime in the future. So again, this is a very good uh, webinar. It's very pertinent. Um, I'd like to introduce our presenter uh, for this webinar. Um, Danielle Egger began her career in Florida in 2005 as an environmental specialist for the Florida Department of Health. During that time, she performed thousands of health inspections in bars, schools, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and hospitals. Edgar was also responsible for training all incoming health inspectors. In 2013, Edgar was nationally recognized by the Food and Drug Administration for her role in protecting against foodborne bioterrorism during the Republican National Convention held in Tampa. That same year, she was also promoted to the role of biological scientist with her primary investigative focus on foodborne illness outbreaks. It was during those investigations that Egger observed the devastating effects foodborne illness had on a business. She saw the need for a liaison between business owners and government entities, believing that education and not regulation could make a difference. 
In 2016, she established Florida Food Safety Systems, a food service consulting company providing hospitality staff food, safety education, kitchen sanitation reviews, actually health inspections, hazard analysis planning, licensing assistance, and most recently providing COVID-19 sanitation guidance to establishments reopening during phase one and phase two throughout the state. Florida Food Safety Systems currently has over 200 clients in the hospitality industry, including bars, restaurants, delis, grocery stores, coffee houses, food trucks, and nursing homes throughout the state of Florida. So as you can see, you can hear, um, Danielle is very, very qualified professionally with tons of experience. She knows what she's talking about. So Danielle, to you, let me have you take it over. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Bank United, for the opportunity to come and speak with you. Um, of course, as small local businesses, we all have to work together. We are a community here, and these are some rough times that we're going through. So together, we can make this happen, and we're going to come out from this stronger than we were before. And I think that everybody is ready to just get back to some sort of normalcy. Um, hopefully, we can make that happen soon. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, give me a second here. So, so um, again, thank you, Steve, for the introduction. I really appreciate it. The community goal that we're trying to develop um, is that we want to come in contact with uh, industry specific sanitation practices. So we really want to um, operate effectively and also give our customers confidence back. We want them to come back and we want them to feel safe when they're working with us. Um, it does, however, remain the responsibility of our local businesses to comply with all applicable laws locally. So um, that does include the Americans with Disabilities Act and for our restaurant industry, our food service industry that involves the Food uh, and Drug Administration Food Code. Uh, this is a novel virus and much remains unknown. It is so important that we remain flexible during this time. Uh, we also have to remain vigilant and patient because everything changes on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, when I was writing this uh, presentation, the CDC changed some of their guidelines. So <laughs> things have actually changed as we're going over this and redoing the presentation. So how are we going to safely reopen? What are the first steps? Step number one, if you are uh, occupying a building that has been unoccupied for any extended period of time, that includes our bars, um, any of our offices or anything where the water may have sat in our pipes, we want to flush those water lines first and foremost. We live in beautiful, sunny, hot weather here in South Florida. Um, unfortunately, that also promotes the growth of Legionella in our inactive water pipes in standing water. So to flush our pipes, we just need to run water through those pipes. Um, that means just turn on all the water in any faucet you have. That includes showers, sinks, in kitchens, that's going to involve ice machines or any ice wells, your floor drains, dish machines. A big one with the kitchens and the bars, especially when the bars reopen, the draft systems for the beer kegs. This may be something that you want to contact your distributor for um, to see if they have any kind of input on how to uh, flush those systems. Also, any of your water features like fountains and your water heater, you'll want to follow your manufacturer's guidance on that. Again, it's important that we flush these water lines because that stagnant water in those lines can cause a lot of illnesses. Additionally, there have been several cases reported of COVID-19 being transmitted through recirculated air. That being said, it's important that we have our, um, our HVAC systems looked at. That's going to be our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Um, also in kitchens, hood systems should be inspected prior to opening. Any of your filters should also be replaced. Um, that includes any, any filters that are in your hood systems or any filters in your HVAC systems. Additionally, um, if it's possible, increase that air circulation, get that airflow through there. Also, difficult in South Florida, I understand, especially this time of year. 
If it is possible to open some windows and doors and still do that safely without allowing access from children or anybody into the facility, open those doors and get some fresh air in there. Um, that's going to just reduce the opportunity for that COVID to be spread through air. So as we do decide to open, we need to implement a plan that's going to limit our capacity. We're not open to full capacity right now, obviously, and it's going to take some time before we are. So some ways to deal with that, um, if it is possible, designate one door as an entrance and designate a separate door as an exit. What that's going to do is eliminate the face-to-face -face time that people have as they're passing through that threshold. That's just going to give them one more opportunity to socially distance. If that's not an option, install arrows to guide people in the right direction. If you've been to any of our grocery stores lately or any of our other stores, most of them do have those arrows pointing in one direction. Also, on a more personal note, it kind of gives you a nice little personal touch, so that's an added benefit. You can designate a greeter to actually stand at the door. Um, that greeter can hold the door for people so that they're not coming in manual contact with that door handle. Additionally, you can provide them with a bottle of sanitizer, hand sanitizer, so that they can push that sanitizer into the people's hands as they're coming through the door. And that also gives them the opportunity to count heads. Obviously, like I said, our capacity is going to be limited. That's going to let you know how many people are in your facility at any given time. A couple of other things you can do. Install hand sanitizing stations throughout your building. Um, if you can't uh, construct a hand sanitizer station, maybe just put out pumps of hand sanitizer throughout the store or the restaurant. Waste receptacles coming out of bathrooms or anywhere where people might be washing their hands should be covered. Um, there hasn't really been any proof that there's anything flying off of paper towels, but just as a precaution, if people are putting their rubber gloves in there or their masks, that lid should be provided to those, um, to the trash cans. Also, space markers every six feet, just as one more reminder why we should be socially distancing and constructing protective barriers. Um, in our restaurants, we've seen everything from PVC wrapped with plastic wrap. We've seen doors wrapped with plastic wrap. Um, we've seen plexiglass. Basically, anything in the kitchen that can be used, or in any facility, rather, it can be used for a shield or a barrier to prevent any kind of um, aerosolized particles from forming um, would be protective. And always make sure that your plans are updated. Keep these written plans on site because inspectors are going to be coming around up in our northern and central Florida where we're um, into phase two now. We have seen regulators come around and actually check those plans. So make sure that your plans are updated and they are kept on site to provide to the inspectors. Something else. And um, from North Florida experience, hopefully we can learn from this. Um, designate teams when you're scheduling your staff. This means, for example, team A, B, and C. So employees that'll socialize together outside of work should be considered on one team. We'll just call them team A. Team A should work together the entire time during this whole pandemic. Um, that way, if somebody from team A is diagnosed with COVID, you can remove the entire team A and you are still able to function because there's been middle, minimal contact between teams B and C. So you're still able to keep teams B and C on site while team A is in quarantine. Um, another thing that we've seen, keep your employees stationary at one location. If you have a chain or if you have multiple locations, and you have managers or any staff that goes between those locations, it's a good idea right now to keep those uh, managers in a single location. If possible, teleconference or do whatever you need to do, just try to stay out of those facilities. Because if one of those managers falls ill and they're in between your facilities, you'll have to close those facilities to allow for cleaning. This also helps ease that bird of contact tracing, which means that it'll be easier for us to contact, contact any sources that might have been in contact with the ill person. So we're open and we're running, and now we have an employee that is tested positive. So what do we do? 
we have to send that employee home immediately to isolate. Also, identify all close contacts. Close contacts is going to be anybody who's been in contact with the ill person for um, within six feet for a minimum of 15 minutes or somebody who has been in close physical contact and may have received some kind of um, aerosolized particles. So if somebody coughed on them or anything. Close contacts for 48 hours prior to that diagnosis should also be considered exposed. And close contacts should also immediately isolate for 14 days. This is the new ruling from CDC. It doesn't matter whether they've tested negative during the quarantine or not, they still must isolate for 14 days before returning to work, regardless of a test result. So when your employee does test positive, we have to be mindful of confidentiality. ADA, we have to keep our, um, our patients safe with all of their information. The best way to explain to your, uh, anybody who may have been potentially exposed is to say, you may have been potentially exposed to COVID-19. Here is our protocol. Please go get tested. You never want to disclose the person who was infected. Also, any contact surfaces need to be sanitized immediately. Any close contact areas where that ill employee may have worked should definitely be sanitized. And just because you have an ill employee does not mean that you necessarily have to close down your facility. Again, if you have those teams that are working teams B and C, you can remain open as long as those possibly impacted customers or uh, employees are not on site. Um, if possible though, we do recommend that you close the facility for 24 hours before you sanitize it. The reason for that is because it will give those particles a chance to kind of settle onto a surface before um, for safety purposes. Uh, additionally, HVAC filters should be changed again and ventilation should be increased also. That's going to filter out any of those potential pathogens. So the rule that has recently changed, a symptomatic employee, so somebody who has been diagnosed and who had symptoms, can return to work as soon as 10 days have appeared or 10 days have passed since their last or since their symptoms first appeared. So they had symptoms uh, and 10 days have passed. And at least 24 hours have passed since their last fever. Now the trick with that fever is that it cannot be reduced with the use of medications. It has to naturally be reduced. And their symptoms such as a cough and shortness of breath have improved. So, Basically, 10 days since their first symptoms first appeared, um, at least 24 hours since their last fever, and their symptoms have improved. They do, no, they do not any longer need a, a test result to go back to work. However, an asymptomatic positive employee, this is somebody who tested positive but that did not have symptoms, may return to work after at least 10 days have passed since the date of their positive lab test. So the date of their positive lab test, add 10 days to that, they can then return to work. And those close contacts we, we talked about, those are going to be anybody who's been in six feet for 15 minutes or more with those positive cases. They, have, um, they must isolate for 14 days. They um, have to remain symptom-free during that time also. So how can we reduce the risk of COVID-19 on our surfaces? Well, first we have to understand how long these have been detected on particular surfaces. COVID-19 has been detected in aerosols. That's going to be any air particles for up to three hours before they settle. Um, COVID-19 was also detected on cardboard for up to 24 hours and also on plastic and stainless steel for up to three days. So that means that we have to sanitize our surfaces frequently. And speaking of sanitizers, use only EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency's list of registered disinfectants for um, taking care of COVID-19. 
not every sanitizer might disinfect for that. So it's important to review the list. It is available on the Environmental Protection Agency's website. Uh, an important factor to remember, food service must still adhere to the FDA food code. Fortunately, the sanitizers used in our kitchens are usually the sanitizers that are recommended to kill COVID-19. So we're kind of ahead of the game on that one, um, but they still must adhere to the FDA food code. Additionally, you must follow your manufacturer's instructions when you are using those sanitizers. Each sanitizer has different instructions, different contact times, which we'll kind of explain here in a second. Um, so it's important to follow the manufacturer's specifications. We're gonna cover two of the most common sanitizers used for disinfection for COVID-19, chlorine bleach and quaternary ammonium. First of all, chlorine bleach, if you are using chlorine bleach, it must be intended for disinfection. It has to say on the actual label that it is a disinfecting bleach. If you look at certain bleaches, they will say that they're just used for whitening. Um, those are not acceptable. They do specifically have to say that they're intended for disinfection. The contact time on a surface, that means the time that it takes to kill a virus on a surface, ranges anywhere between one to 10 minutes, depending on the brand. Um, and also you can refer to that EPA guide that I talked about for your specific brand to find out how much contact time is needed. And for that solution concentration, so that's going to be how much bleach you mix with water, it should be between 50 to 100 parts per million. That equals out to about four teaspoons of bleach for each cap of water. I'm sorry, for each quart of water, not cap of water. Um, quaternary ammonium is commonly used in commercial kitchens as a sanitizer. Its surface contact time varies between five to 10 minutes. Again, that has to sit on that surface between five to 10 minutes to kill the virus. You must follow the manufacturer's specifications for that and also that solution concentration is usually between 200 to 400 parts per million. So it is a little bit stronger. Um, and it is important that, again, you follow the manufacturer's specifications because we never want to mix chemicals. So as far as keeping our staff and our guests safe, inform your staff of any protocols for COVID-19 testing. Again, we talked about how if you do have somebody that tests positive, they must remain anonymous let your staff know, you may have potentially been exposed. Here are our protocols for COVID-19 testing, testing. And of course, reiterate the importance of proper hand hygiene. If nothing else, just make sure that everybody is washing their hands properly and frequently. Also keeping guests safe, consider posting signage at the entrances, informing guests that if they're not feeling well, they shouldn't come into the establishment. Um, let them know of your sanitation practices that you've adopted since COVID started, and also remind them kindly of social distancing guidelines. It's all about perception with our customers and keeping everybody safe, of course. Um, if you do require your staff to wear uniforms or aprons or chef coats or anything, now might be a time to step up and provide them clean uniforms daily. Nobody wants to see a dirty employee come out from the back of the house out to the front of the house. Make sure that everybody is wearing clean uniforms. Sanitize your high touch areas every 30 minutes. This is going to vary between businesses. Um, your cash transaction machines, your credit card transactions machines, any surfaces, keyboards, uh, computer mouse, anything like that needs to be sanitized every 30 minutes. Also, a good rule of thumb, when you're done sanitizing all those surfaces every 30 minutes, wash your hands. If you're not doing it more often, um, 30 minutes is a good rule of thumb for that. So after you handle that sanitizer, you now have that sanitizer on your hands, it's a good time to wash that off. You may also want to consider going cashless or contactless. So instead of accepting cash, which who knows where that cash has been, you can now accept credit cards, um, or do pay through the phone. So what do we do if we're working and we notice that a guest is starting to show symptoms? This can be tricky because of course we can't just escort the guest off of our property. 
So we have to train staff on how to react if a customer is displaying symptoms. This is going to vary from uh, business to business. We're going to equip our staff with the appropriate personal protective equipment and immediately provide the ill guest with tissues or napkins. Offer the guest hand sanitizer or any other kind of disinfectant and be prepared to put the guests in touch with any medical resources. Your sanitation procedures that you would have followed originally should be followed if you do have an ill guest. And make sure that you document any employee or anybody who may have had contact with that guest to keep it easy for contact tracing. We discussed those emergency closing procedures and other procedures. Keep those emergency closing procedures updated. In the event that heaven forbid you have to close um, because there has been an, a serious outbreak, you need to have those procedures updated. Also, monitor absenteeism. If you work in a field where you're starting to see people call in with respiratory symptoms, it may be something you want to investigate a little bit further. Create cleaning checklists. Designate a manager to monitor and document all of the cleaning going on. This will be good for a number of reasons. If there is an investigation that happens because of an outbreak, you will have all the documentation needed. Just make sure that those checklists are up to date and make sure that they are being completed nightly. A couple more tips. Allow your customers to observe your staff frequently cleaning. In a restaurant, make sure that your customers see your staff blatantly sanitizing tables, sanitizing menus, sanitizing anything that might be out. Also, keep your social media and your websites up to date. Let your customers know the extra steps that you're taking to make them safe. Consider providing hand sanitizer wipes or little packets of hand sanitizer gel for your guests. If in a restaurant, you can put them at each table. If at a retail store, you can put them in different areas, um, you know, the stands or anything that are temporary, you can put those up. And then you can also post signage touting your uh, frequent cleaning schedule. If you wanna get detailed, you can even tell them exactly what you're doing. Totally up to you. And most importantly, thank the guests for supporting you during this challenging time. We're all in this together, as everybody says right now, and it is so true. So it's important that we express gratitude for our guests because they're out here supporting our businesses and you know, we wanna make sure that they're safe. A few more ways to remain warm and welcoming while still providing safe service. Rearrange your establishment. If you have a store, situate your shelving. Chances are your stock is going to be a little bit depleted right now just because of the supply chain. That means you might be able to remove some of those shelves and actually have a little bit more space. If you're in a restaurant, situate those tables differently. If you can, remove the extra tables because it looks a little more com comforting and warming than seeing yellow cord and tape around a table that might be sitting there empty. If you have space, move those extra tables out. Run promotions, consider doing giveaways just to get your regulars back in there and to bring in some new customers as well. Let your uh, customers know that if you're updating hours, um, that you're doing so to facilitate proper sanitation measures. If you've noticed some of our restaurants and our grocery stores around the area do have adjusted hours because they are using that extra time to clean and sanitize their surfaces. If you have regulars, many of us in the small business industry have regulars. If you have their contact information, reach out to them. It's very personal. Let them know that you're open for business and let them know that they're missed. Let them know that you appreciate their, their coming back and um, explain to them what you're doing to make them feel safer. And when you do have guests in your store or your restaurant or your office, whatever, make sure that you ask them what they would do to make them feel comfortable. Um, it, this, this might vary from person to person. So um, you might get some information that you didn't even think about. Make sure that you have signing requesting, if you are in the retail industry, signing requesting minimal touching of products. That means don't touch things that you're not going to buy. Less manual contact reduces the risk 
of, of spreading COVID-19. Also consider designating a staff member to assess, assist guests with handling products. So that if there is a problem, it's only one set of hands that's on that item instead of 20. <laughs> um, provide gloves at the entryway. If you are in the retail business and you know that people are going to touch things, provide them gloves when they come in the store. And contrary to what most retail places usually follow, display those price tags. Usually, especially with apparel, price tags are hidden and people have to dig for those. If you have them conspicuously displayed, people are not going to have to touch those tags to see the price of items. Also for retail, for now, prohibit the use of dressing rooms. Provide protective barriers. This is going to be what we call in the food industry a sneeze guard. This is just any kind of plexiglass or any kind of protective barrier that protects an employee from a guest sneezing or coughing. If you have sample tables for either food or makeup or anything, now is the time to remove those from the store. Again, sanitize high touch areas, your doorknobs, restroom doors, uh, point of sale systems, any credit card transaction machines, anything that customers may have touched, sanitize frequently. Consider converting to online retail. So where you have stuff in stores, now you can also sell it online. And then also um, follow any, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> there we go. Follow any rules as far as scheduling goes. Um, follow the team rule. Again, like we said with our other agencies, team A, team B, and team C. Somebody from team A gets diagnosed, pull team A out, you're still able to operate with your other two teams. As far as our office buildings go, check for mold growth. Um, it's possible that if the building's been empty for so long, it's really humid in South Florida. It's possible that we might have mold growth. Also pests may have taken over and stagnant water. Service those HVAC systems like we talked about with our other industries. Um, also, consider installing HEPA filters, high efficiency particulate air filters. Um, if your building does have a cooling tower, also inspect that cooling tower. Office-wise, consider removing coffee makers. We all love our coffee. We all love our water. Um, the same can be said for water fountains. Any kind of communal service should probably be removed. Encourage your staff to bring in their own coffee, bring in their own water. That's just one less point of contact. Use visual cues. Use those stickers indicating your six feet distances. Adjust your chairs in the reception area so that they're safely spaced. If you have an office, cordon off each, every other chair, or um, in your break rooms also. Spread those chairs out in the break rooms. Consider staggering shifts. If everybody works first shift, maybe consider starting a second shift temporarily. If an employee takes public transportation, maybe offer them incentives if they walk or bike to work. Public transportation is an enclosed area. It can increase the risk for contracting COVID-19. So offer them incentives, maybe give them a bonus if they're walking or biking to work. Also ask employees to wash their hands upon entering the building. This is a good way to ensure that they're leaving whatever they have at the door. Uh, remind employees not to touch their faces. This is tricky. We don't realize how much we touch our face. It's a natural occurrence. It happens. Remind employees not to touch their faces. And if you have employees that travel for work, try using teleconferencing instead. As we see right now, Zoom is a perfect option for this. Um, we have many platforms that we can use. So reduce work travel and use teleconferencing when possible. If you have elevators or escalators in your building, encourage your staff to take the stairs when possible. In addition to being a little bit healthier, um, it can also eliminate that enclosed area in an elevator. If possible, designate sides on stairwells. 
If you have more than one stairwell, maybe designate one stairwell for up, one stairwell for down. Um, distance decals and elevators and use stanchions. Those would be your velvet ropes, for instance, in lobbies just to mark pathways um, to ensure that everybody's keeping their distance. Minimize touching an elevator. Use your knuckle or your elbow to push buttons on the elevator and also encourage hand washing after elevator use. If that's not possible, install a hand sanitizer station outside of the elevators. This is now also a good time for you to update your sick leave policies. In a lot of industries, employees know that if they don't go to work, they don't receive a paycheck. Unfortunately, right now, that means that they're coming to work with their respiratory illnesses and they're increasing their risk for contaminating the other employees. Now is probably a good time to create a new sick leave policy that will encourage employees to stay home when they're sick. If you don't currently offer sick leave, you may want to draft a punitive uh, sick leave policy just to kind of have that covered. And also the policies need to be flexible. Um, of course, health guidance is changing regularly, so we do need to keep that flexible. As far as our local parks, display signs reminding everybody to socially distance. Also, make sure that they're covering their cough and they're staying home when they're sick. Public restrooms should be sanitized at least twice per day. And if you do have big events scheduled in the park, concerts or festivals or anything like that, have a contingency plan. Unfortunately, as we've seen, a lot of these larger events have been canceled, so we need to have a contingency plan for that. As far as swimming pools, there is no evidence that suggests that COVID-19 is spread through recreational water, so we're not going to worry about that too much. However, other illnesses are, so make sure that you're monitoring those chemicals in that pool. As far as playgrounds go, the state and local regulations are going to tell you when the time comes to reopen those. It's not really necessary to disinfect wood or ground cover. Um, and routine disinfection should be done for any kind of metal, like the swing sets, handrails, or benches that are not wood. Um, but it's not an effective use of disinfectants to sanitize the wood or the ground cover. Um, also ensure that if you are using disinfectant on any of the uh, swing equipment or the handrails, make sure that it is thoroughly air dried prior to the children playing on it. We don't want any kind of, we don't want any of the children getting sick. And make sure that those disinfectants, if you are using them in playgrounds, that they are stored in a secure area and locked away from children. When it comes to youth camps and sports, Consult your professional, um, your public health professionals to provide guidance. This is going to be a case by case basis, I think. And um, although the CDC is offering guidelines for opening youth programs, it's going to be up to the town of Miami Lakes to decide how they want to proceed with that. And of course, food safety. Fortunately, if there is any silver lining to any of this, is that COVID-19 has not been identified as a foodborne illness. Fortunately, we do know that COVID-19 is extremely heat sensitive, which is beneficial for our food service industry. So um, also fortunate is that the FDA food code guidelines that were already being practiced by our kitchens um, was effective enough to reduce the pathogen count on surfaces. So kitchens are pretty safe that way. However, it is important that we provide additional food handling training for our staff because it isn't 100% ruled out that um, they may get somebody sick. Bring your team in, your prep team in during off hours. If you're like most kitchens, you might have a limited space. Therefore, if you bring your prep team in when the rest of the team isn't there, um, preferably during closed hours, you're eliminating the amount or you're reducing the amount of people that are going to be in that facility. Reduce your delivery schedule to once a week. Unfortunately, most likely with reduced capacity um, at our restaurants, there's a reduced need for food. That being said, reduce that delivery schedule to once a week. That's one less person coming in contact with your staff that may be infected. Prohibit bare hand contact with ready to eat food. 
although highly unlikely, again, um, it is possible from COVID-19 to be transferred from one surface to another. So prohibit bare hand contact with food that is going to be ready to eat and train your employees to wash their hands prior to putting on gloves. Employees are supposed to be washing their hands prior to putting on gloves. Something that I have to say, because it is specified in the FDA food code and all of our restaurants have to be aware of this, hand sanitizers are not effective against norovirus. Norovirus is a stomach illness um, commonly associated with food. Therefore, hand sanitizers are only allowed in kitchens after hands have been properly washed with soap and water. So how do we appropriately wash our hands? Well, there is a process. <laughs> if you're using a paper towel that is in a lever type dispenser, that's going to be one of the levers that you have to crank down to get the paper towel to come out. Dispense that paper towel prior to hand washing because we don't know how many people have touched that lever before you that didn't wash their hands. Start with hot water. Hot water is considered above 100 degrees wet your hands and apply the soap. We need to scrub and lather between our fingers, under our nails and our cuticles and around our wrists for at least 20 seconds. Rinse your hands after 20 seconds and use disposable paper towels to dry your hands. Reusable towels do carry bacteria, so it's important that we're using disposable towels. Um, use that same paper towel that you just dried your hands with to turn off the faucet and then use that paper towel to also open any adjacent doors. At that point, you can then discard the paper towel. As far as the guests, remove condiments and table tents from tables. If you usually have salt and pepper shakers and extra, um, extra items sitting on the tables, now's the time to remove those. Those are just extra items for somebody to touch. If possible, utilize disposable menus, or if you have the option to do a QR code and pull up your menu online. A lot of restaurants up here in the northern section are doing that now. Also, many people are still going to be very apprehensive about eating out in a restaurant or just going out in public in general. So continue with your takeout menu. If this is something you hadn't thought about before, um, think about items on your menu that travel well. Maybe pack them up, cook it up, pack it up, put it in the back of your car, drive around for an hour, and then taste it. If it tastes okay, it might be a good item to continue with to go. Um, otherwise, you know, um, come up with new items. People do want to get out, but they're still apprehensive about sitting in a restaurant. So continue with that takeout menu. And last but not least, I want to leave you with this little piece of information. We're again, lucky that COVID-19 is heat sensitive. However, we do have a point of vulnerability in our kitchens and that would be our dish machines. So for the dish machines, we have two different types. There are low temperature dish machines. Those are dish machines that use a little bit cooler water, but they use chemicals. The problem we have with those is that a lot of times it's a machine. Those machines don't always uh, pump the right amount of sanitizer into the, into the actual wash cycle. So that's a concern. We have to monitor those dish machines frequently. Also, if the machine's not sanitizing, it's important that we immerse those dishes into a sink full of sanitizer solution before they're used again. Don't towel dry those dishes because as we said earlier, the sanitizer continues to work as it air dries and it has to sit on that surface anywhere between one to 10 minutes. So let that sanitizer air dry on those dishes and check your dish machines frequently. Okay, so as we know, we have a long road ahead of us. Don't let that discourage you. We're a community. We can come out of this much stronger and healthier than before. And I think that's what's going to happen. We're on the right path. We're gonna do everything the right way and we're gonna get through this stronger than before. And I look forward to working with the town of Miami Lakes again soon. 
So I'm opening this up for any questions now, if anybody has any questions. And also I'm going to leave my contact information. And a special thank you, of course, to Bank United, the Town of Miami Lakes Economic Development Committee, and the Town of Miami Lakes, of course. Thank you so much. Are there Daniel, any? Daniel, this is Steve uh, with Bank United. I have a question specific to the uh, CDC guideline about um, not requiring a negative test. Yes. For returning. I, I've got to assume that's very, very recent information, right? It what, is. What was, can you, can you provide any background or maybe any possible rationale for that or the thinking or what made them change their, um, their, their stance and something like that, if you're able to? Um, in my opinion, and I don't know if this is, <laughs> if this was the logic behind it. Um, the requirement before was that the CDC required two negative test results with at least 24 hours apart. Um, it was extremely difficult for uh, patients to get those test results back in a timely manner. And I think that it was just causing a lot of uh, deadlock with who can be working and who can't be. Um, do I necessarily personally think that this is a better way? No, but again, um, it's still an unknown virus. There's still a lot that we have to learn. Um, I, I, but I do think that it had a lot to do with the, the testing and the time that it took to get test results back and the efficiency with the businesses themselves. Okay, thank you very much. I found this presentation um, excellent. Uh, I think the content was great. I really hope that um, our restaurant owners and our business owners within our local community here um, have a chance to, um, to either see it live or maybe see it again once it's streamed out. I just thought the material was on point. Again, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. And we are, I do, I'll put this back up here actually. Um, if anybody has any questions or anything after this, we are helping with um, opening plans and, um, you know, specific to the businesses. So if there's anything that we can do, please don't hesitate to reach out to us also. We're here to help you. Daniela, I don't see any other questions in the Zoom chat as of right now. So I don't know if you received any questions prior to the webinar. I did not, no, which could be a good thing. So, so far, I don't see any questions in the uh, Zoom chat. Okay, wonderful. Well, again, my information is here too. So if anybody comes up with something afterwards, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. And thank you, Brandon and the team at, my, at the town of Miami Lakes for putting this together. It's, again, I thought it was very well worthwhile. Thank you very much. Thank you.